Last time, you may recall, we started talking about the periodic table and actually took a more in-depth look at the setup of that periodic table and how it was arranged both horizontally and vertically, vertically by the number of valence electrons in each of the atoms. So now as we begin chapter five, we're gonna concentrate more on those valence electrons as we look at the principles of bonding and the types of chemical bonds that atoms do to form molecules and elements do to form compounds. So are we ready to begin chapter five? On the last set of notes, the last page focused just a bit on what we call electron dot notation. And you'll see more examples of those as we go through this set of notes. But remember, the notation shows the atoms valence electrons and valence electrons only. Let's put chlorine up here on the screen. And remember, chlorine is in group 7A. The halogens also in group 17. Seven valence electrons. And remember, the magic number that atoms are trying to get, with a few exceptions, that magic number is eight valence electrons. So somehow, chlorine needs to get that eighth valence electron to become stable. And this chapter is just a little bit about how that might happen. Remember this term, electronegativity. Long, fancy word with a very simple meaning. All that word means is how well the atom can grab on to extra electrons, the ability to attract and hold extra electrons. Now remember from before that metals tend to give away valence electrons and nonmetals tend to attract extra electrons. That means metals will have a low electronegativity. Again, look at the definition of electronegativity, attract and hold, but metals don't do that. Metals give those electrons away, so they have what we call low electronegativity. It is the nonmetals that have the high electronegativity, the ability to attract and hold electrons. So nonmetals are going to add on to their valence electrons until they can get up to the number eight. Remember that magic number eight with a few exceptions. Ready? Chemical bonds are all about the electrostatic attraction of atoms when transferring electrons to form molecules. Now that's a nice fancy schmancy textbook definition. In a little bit simpler term, chemical bonds is atoms sharing or transferring valence electrons so they can stick together. And when atoms stick together, their properties become very, very different than what the single atoms have. This is how the elements form compounds or the atoms form molecules. If we're talking about just single atoms coming together, then those make a molecule. If we're talking about a sample of the atoms known as an element, then bonding is how elements form compounds, H2O dihydrogen monoxide or water. And we'll look a little bit at how that happens in chapter five that we're doing now. Ready? Chemical bonds, remember that most atoms are too unstable to stay by themselves. And that's because most atoms have fewer than eight valence electrons. Only the noble gases from neon down through radon on your periodic table, straight down that last group, have their eight valence electrons. Helium, remember, has only one energy level, so helium has only two total electrons, and therefore two valence electrons, making helium also very stable. But as you see here, most of the atoms are too unstable because they have too few valence electrons. They need to get eight somehow. Few elements are stable enough to stay pure and uncombined. Noble gases are like that. And a few of the transition metals, they're reactive. They would love to get their valence electrons, but it's okay if they don't. Something like zinc or copper or gold or silver, they're going to stay by themselves pretty well. And they'll combine if they're made to, but they'd really prefer not to. Forming compounds makes the atoms and molecules stable because each atom involved will have its completed octet. 
Oxygen, for example, will end up, instead of the six valence electrons it starts out with, will end up with eight valence electrons, and we'll show you how that happens. The one thing to keep in mind, though, is that many of the bonds include hydrogen, and hydrogen has only one energy level, so is therefore satisfied and stable with two valence electrons. Just a couple quick definitions. An element is a sample of a substance and all the same kind of atoms. So if you have a chunk of gold, then all the atoms that make up that chunk, that sample, are gold atoms with 79 protons and 79 total electrons. A compound is when two or more elements come together and the elements would then have different kinds of atoms and those would combine. And when chemical bonds happen, atoms turn into molecules and elements turn into compounds. Ready? Octet rule once again, eight valence electrons with a few exceptions. I've told you about hydrogen and helium previously and said there are a few more and we'll talk about those in just a moment. Actually, the first five elements are the exceptions. So what are the first five elements? Well, we've mentioned hydrogen, and I'll go ahead and put it way over here to represent the big gap on that first period of the periodic table. And then we have lithium here, and next to lithium we have beryllium, and not quite all the way over, but a little bit further over we have boron. And in a moment, I'll tell you why lithium, beryllium, and boron are also exceptions to the octet rule. Hydrogen and helium have only the one energy level that never passes two valence electrons. Let's do a Bohr model of hydrogen. Only one energy level and only one electron. Here's helium now. Only one energy level and two electrons. Remember, the first energy level can never, ever, ever, ever pass two electrons. So there's no way that either of these can get up to eight. Therefore, the first energy level is full. These two atoms would then be stable. Well, hydrogen would have to combine with another atom to get that second electron, and helium already has the second electron. So now both of these would be considered full and stable. So that's why hydrogen and helium are exceptions to the octet rule. But so are lithium, beryllium, and boron. And I'll show you with just the lithium one, the other two work in a very similar way. Here's your Bohr model of lithium. Two electrons on the first and one electron on the second. And over your periodic table, you have this electron structure on there, one, two for lithium. Well, when lithium combines with something such as fluorine, I'll talk more about the combining of these atoms in a little while. Well, lithium's gonna get rid of this electron and actually give that electron to fluorine. What happens then? This entire energy level disappears. Okay, I'll replenish this one. And it has only that first energy level left over with those two valence electrons. So now lithium is more like hydrogen and helium in that regard. Now beryllium has two valence electrons on its second level to give away, and boron has three valence electrons on its second level to give away. And that's why these three atoms are also exceptions to the octet rule. So the first five elements are exceptions. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron. Other than that, all the other atoms are trying to get to eight valence electrons. But then there's this wise guy, element number 46, palladium. For some reason that, honestly, I do not know, that one has 18 valence electrons. It's the only atom that has more than eight. Atoms can share or transfer electrons to form bonds, and most of the rest of this session of notes talks about that sharing and that transferring of those electrons. And that's how atoms will combine to form molecules. Now, when an atom completely gives away an electron, which would be transfer, I showed you with the lithium a moment ago, then that atom would have an electric charge. Now, depending on whether we have a metal or a nonmetal, then we would get a positive charge and a negative charge. Let's go back to that lithium. Lithium starts, let's move that up a little. Lithium starts with those three electrons Nope, in the way, there we go, but gives this one away. But lithium still has its three protons. 
But because this one has now gone away, there are only two electrons left. That's going to be a negative one total charge. A positive one total charge. Get my integers right. So metals are actually going to give away electrons, and that's the definition of a metal, and end up with a positive charge. Positive however many electrons are gone. For beryllium, that would give away two. Let's move that out of the way. So beryllium would end up with a positive two. Lithium would be a positive one. And boron would give away all three of its valence electrons to get a positive three. Now the nonmetals that take those electrons, as you will see in just a little bit, they're going to end up with the negative electric charge. So an ion is any atom that has changed its number of electrons and therefore will now have a net electric charge that is not zero, either positive or negative. Ready? When atoms combine, their properties change, and I mean change drastically. Chemical bonding changes properties of elements in a very drastic way. Remember, hydrogen and oxygen, we mentioned before, are either explosive or flammable. Hydrogen is explosive when put near a flame. Oxygen is very flammable, helps fire burn. Now those are gases, both of them at room temperature. But you know about H2O, water, at room temperature is a liquid that puts out fires. Well, right away, understanding that tells me that the properties have to be very, very different if two flammable or even explosive gases turn into a liquid that puts out fires, is an extinguisher. And the stability of the octet rule is one of the reasons these atoms' properties change so drastically. Another very common substance, sodium and chlorine. Sodium, when dropped in water, wait a little bit, that sodium will explode. Chlorine gas, don't do this because chlorine gas is deadly, sniffed directly from a container, you have about a 97% chance of dropping dead instantly, so don't do that. However, both of those two atoms are so very reactive, the sodium cannot wait to give an electron to the chlorine. And you're gonna see this again in a little while. That one valence electron to the chlorine, which I showed you before has seven, will now have eight valence electrons. And the property changes of each atom into something that we eat and actually need to eat in the correct amount of every day. So the changing of the properties is very, very drastic when atoms combine. Now, obviously, I'm not going to draw this, but carbon and oxygen are both flammable. They'll burn very easily. Hydrogen is explosive, but you get the correct number of these atoms combined in just the right way. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. Each of the 12 hydrogens will end up with two valence electrons, and each of the six carbons and the six oxygens will end up with their octet of eight valence electrons, giving us a sugar molecule, glucose, that we like to put on our cereal, put into our tea, find in candy bars. That's the sugar that we think of when we say, hey, let's need some sugar. Ready? All right, the types of bonds. We're gonna talk about covalent and ionic in some detail, and in a little while I'll just define metallic, but this class doesn't really deal much with metallic other than what the definition is. So covalent and ionic bonds. Remember that metals love to give away the electrons, and the reason for that is, if you look at something such as sodium, which I mentioned a moment ago, now sodium's structure, if you look at the periodic table, that we use in class, you'll see two electrons on the first level, eight on the second, and one on the third. Well, when sodium gives away that one valence electron, let's say that's gone, now look at the next level that becomes the new valence level. What's that number? That number is eight. You're gonna find that a lot. Go straight down group 1A. From sodium all the way down, you can look at cesium, and you'll notice the one is last, but in each of those, such as potassium, which is 2881, get rid of that valence electron, 
The third level is now valence when potassium combines with something such as bromide. Now you see why the alkalis really, really, really want to get rid of that first, uh, last energy level. Calcium is 2882. Well, calcium will combine with oxygen. These two valence electrons will go over here and over here, making this last level disappear. So that third level is now valence, eight valence electrons. And you look at the numbers before that last number, you're gonna see the number eight in most cases. And that's why metals like to give away their electrons. Non-metals like to add on to the electrons. All right, let's finish off that calcium and oxygen thing. Calcium will give away those two. Oxygen, let's change colors for a moment. One, two, three, four, five, six. But oxygen needs two more now to make eight. And here's where oxygen will get that. One from the calcium atom and one from the calcium atom, the other electron. And now, since those electrons are here, let's play connect the dots now. This is the one reason I like to use the different colors. Now let's play connect the dots here and we'll notice there are eight electrons on that outside energy level for oxygen now. Calcium got rid of these two and we'll have a charge now of positive two because of giving away two electrons. That's gonna take some practice we're going to do a lot of practice. Electronegativity of atoms involved determines a type of bond, which is a fancy way of saying this. If you put a metal with a nonmetal, you're going to get what's called an ionic bond. Remember, ions change your number of electrons. If you put two nonmetals, two or more nonmetals together, you'll get what's called a covalent bond. For metallic, that's just two or more transition metals bonded together, but that's all we're gonna worry about for metallic bonding, just the definition, not the details. We'll do covalent and ionic, ready? In covalent bonding, the nonmetals have similar electronegativity. Now oxygen is a little more so than nitrogen because oxygen has six valence electrons and needs two more. Nitrogen has five valence electrons and needs three more, but they're both pretty close to each other as far as similarity goes. They're going to share electrons. You're talking about two nonmetals sharing electrons. Now, let's look at hydrogen, which is H2O, and oxygen. Okay, let's put these for oxygen, and let's put these for hydrogen. Okay, now how are these atoms going to come together? One valence electron needs two, one valence electron needs two, six valence electrons needs eight. Well, here's what's gonna happen. The hydrogen's gonna kinda slide into place right there, and that one will kinda slide into place right there. Now this isn't a transfer, this is a share. So let me come over here, and here's what's really gonna happen now. Hydrogen's one, Hydrogen's one here. Oh, I need to get that over. Oxygen with its six. Six, and you'll notice the sharing right there and right there. Okay, I'm gonna clear this off and do it again. Okay, it doesn't really matter about the colors, but I'm gonna put both hydrogens the same. Hydrogen and oxygen. You can start with either one. Hydrogen's gonna say, hey, you know what? You, oh, forgot to put these. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hydrogen's gonna say, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you an extra electron. Now, when we do practice papers, I'll go through this even better. Hydrogen's gonna say, I'm gonna give you my electron. So each hydrogen's doing that. Now, look around here, you see eight electrons. Look at hydrogen, you see two, and each one is happy with just two, because remember, hydrogen is on the first energy level. Here's your definition of covalent. Co means share, like the co-captains on the team will share those leadership duties. Valent refers to the valence electrons. Covalent. Hmm, amazing how things in science get their names, huh? All right. Two atoms come together in covalent bonding. 
We call that a molecule. Now, molecule, that word's been kind of genericized, generalized to mean any combination of two or more atoms, but realistically, that refers to a covalent bond of nonmetals. Uh, the ionic bond is actually called a formula unit, but we tend to just say molecule in normal conversation, and that's okay. Remember the seven diatomic molecules, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. They use covalent bonding. Remember, these diatomic molecules are far too reactive to stay by themselves. Therefore, they're going to combine with each other. Uh, if hydrogen can't hook up with anybody else, hydrogen will find another hydrogen. And that's exactly what's going to happen, and those are the seven, and I want you to try to memorize those. Ready? Now, how does this happen? I went really quickly with that other example, but let's put two chlorine atoms up here. Again, I like to use the different colors. Here's chlorine, and here is another chlorine. Okay, and here's the way I go through this. Each one has seven valence electrons, as you can see on the picture over here and needs one more. Now, atoms are very generous with their valence electrons. They love to help each other. So let's look at the kind of purplish one on the left. Now, seven valence and purple sees this one over here and says, you know what? You need one more valence electron. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna share one with you. I have seven, I'm gonna share one with you and I'm gonna keep my other six all the way out here. By myself, you can't have those, but I'll share the one that you need. And the other one is gonna say, I'll do the same thing. I'll share one with you, because that's what you need to make eight. You're seven plus one for me, and I'm gonna keep my other six all the way out here. Now, look what happens. If we look around this chlorine atom, count its own seven plus the borrowed one, that's eight. And if we look around this chlorine atom, its own seven valence electrons plus the borrowed one, that's eight. So here in the middle is the sharing. So what happens over here? Each one is going to slide an electron in between to show the sharing. And then we have, as you see here, eight valence electrons, eight valence electrons, two very happy chlorine atoms making a diatomic chlorine molecule. Two chlorine atoms, go ahead and write the words down now. Each one has seven valence electrons and needs one more. And again, atoms are very generous. If they all help each other, everybody's gonna get those eight valence electrons or hydrogen with two. Each will share an electron, so both will have eight. So one more time. Each one is going to put an electron in the pot to share and end up sharing these right here. Now, their own seven plus the other guy's eight. That one's own seven plus the other guy's eight. And what we end up with is a diatomic molecule of chlorine. The bond is held together by sharing those two electrons. Now, covalent bonds, they'll hold together. They're not super strong, though. Something like H2O, water, you get the right amount of energy, and in that case, electricity. Those bonds can be separated back into their original components. So this could become two chlorine atoms again. But remember, those are so reactive, they're going to recombine. An ionic bond's a whole lot stronger. Ready? And look at this covalent bond, you see this is the result we got I was showing you a moment ago. By the sharing, one more time, by the sharing, my own seven plus one I borrowed from you and the other ones, my own seven plus the one borrowed from you, we got the share going on in the middle and we have a diatomic chlorine atom. Okay, here are the words. Each chlorine atom has now shared one valence electron with the other atom because each one recognizes the other one needs one more. Now, each chlorine atom has eight valence electrons thanks to the sharing. Remember that octet rule? Eight 
valence electrons, very, very happy, stable chlorine atoms. Ready? Now, look at this. It's going to look a little funky, but that's okay. Let's do this again. I'll drag the little drawing tool over here where I have a little more room. Okay, we're still talking about covalent bond with nonmetals. Hydrogen. Here's one, and here's the other one. And each one says, oh, you need an electron. Here, I'll share one with you, but remember, I don't have any more because I have only one. And then the red one says, okay, I'll share one with you, and I don't have any more. And this is how we get that shared bond that you see on the left over there. Now look at the oxygen. I'll go ahead and use two different colors. Here's one, and here's one. Oxygen has six valence electrons and needs two more. So each of these looks at each other and says, you need two, I will share two. So the green one says, you need two electrons, I will share two. Remember, oxygen started with six and will keep its other four out here. Go to blue. This blue one says, oh, you need two. So I'll share two in between, and I will keep my other four right out here. Now, what we have is this sharing right here, okay? We wouldn't actually draw all that. I'm just showing you where the sharing is. But what we have is diatomic oxygen and now diatomic hydrogen. And very quickly, let's do water. H. H, I can pick any color, O, and again, each one's going to share what the other one needs. So the oxygen says, hey, hydrogen, you need one more. I'll share one with you, and I'll even share one with you, and I'll keep my other four outside. And then hydrogen says, watch this. Okay, I'll share one with you, but I don't have any left, and I'll share one with you, but I don't have any left. This time I won't draw the circle because I don't want to mess it up, but if you look at hydrogen, Two dots, two dots. Remember, hydrogen's happy with two. Look around oxygen, eight dots. We have a very happy molecule of water. Okay, now let's see the words. In the picture you see on the screen, two hydrogen atoms, both in the first period, obviously. Each one needs one more electron. And in the oxygens, oxygen has six valence electrons. Each one needs two more, and as I showed you a moment ago, each one is sharing two with the other one. So these two go to both oxygens, and these two go to both oxygens. Here is six plus two is eight. Here is six plus two is eight. Everybody is happy when we have the covalent bond and sharing. Ready? All right, now, if we share one pair of electrons, we call that a single covalent bond. In further examples in our assignments, we'll see what we're talking about. I wonder what we call when we have two shared pairs of electrons. What do you think? That is a double covalent bond when we share two pairs of electrons. Hmm, sometimes something like nitrogen. Let's quickly go through nitrogen because nitrogen is in group 5A. All right, let me get that over here. And nitrogen has five valence electrons. Okay, this one's gonna say, hey, you need three more to make eight. You're five plus my three, and I'll keep my other two. And this one will do the same thing. And it'll take some practice and getting used to. Stick with it. Okay, you have five, you need three more. I'll put three here, and I'll keep my other two right there. Now look at each end. My five plus your three, that's eight. And this one says the same thing. Hey, my five plus your three, hey, that's eight. But what we did there is we shared one, two, three pairs of electrons. That's called the triple bond, duh. Sometimes things in science seem tougher than they really are. None in this case. Single, double, and triple bonds based on how many pairs of electrons got shared. Ready? All right, polarity, you look at the water molecule. Okay, look here. When the water molecule comes together, you have to remember the hydrogen stuck its electron further away from the nucleus. Therefore, there's a positive one charge 
and there's a positive one charge on the other hydrogen. Each atom of the same element is going to do the same thing and end up with the same charge. The oxygen side is going to end up with two extra electrons and become negatively charged. Negative two, actually. Now let's do a little bit of math here. What is negative two and a positive one and a positive one? That totals zero. That's what we're looking for, and that's the only time I want you to make zeros in this class. We want a total charge of zero whether we have an ionic or a covalent bond. If so, most likely we did things correctly. Polarity means that there's going to be a positively charged end of the molecule and a negatively charged end of the molecule. That will allow electricity to flow through very well. You may have heard water, even though water is not a metal, conducts electricity very well, especially tap water that has a lot of metal deposits in it. But since water molecules are polarized, they're polar, they have positive ends and negative ends, water conducts electricity very well, so don't mess with water around electricity. The hydrogen end is positive, the oxygen end is negative. Okay, ready? Oh, conducts electricity as we just said. Here we go. In an ionic bond, we have a metal and a non-metal. Okay. I started to talk a little while ago about sodium chloride. Now sodium has one valence electron and chlorine has asked make that a little better. I'm talking about just the valence electrons. Chlorine has seven. Okay. What's going to happen to get these to come together is sodium is simply going to give away that electron and give it to chlorine right there. So that electron is going to end up here. Sodium will have no electrons left in the notation around it. That third energy level goes away. What happens though is sodium now has still its 11 protons, but now only 10 electrons. Remember positive and negative. That's going to give sodium a positive one electric charge. The chlorine just took on that extra electron. Takes a moment to draw using the colors here. Now the chlorine, remember, started with 17 protons and 17 electrons, but now has that extra electron. That's going to be negative 1. So we'll put the negative there. In science, you don't have to put the 1 there. You usually don't, but it's okay if you do. But what is positive 1 and negative 1? That equals 0. So what we have, here's our finished product. I'll erase the extra material now. This is our finished product. Here's before, and we'll have to practice these during the assignments, and here's the after. And with the metallic, or sorry, the ionic bond, I do want to see you do the before and the after. Okay, the metal will transfer the valence electrons to the nonmetal. So for something like magnesium or calcium, that would have been two valence electrons that got sent away. A metal becomes positively charged. Remember, that's called an ion. And the positively charged metal is called a cation, not a cation, cation. The nonmetal will take on the extra electrons and become negatively charged. Well, if magnesium gives away two electrons, magnesium will get positive two. If oxygen adds two electrons, oxygen would then become negative two. Well, what happens if there's something like magnesium and fluorine, where magnesium gives away two and fluorine can take only one? We're going to see that in a little bit. Positive and negative are opposite charges. And what do we know about opposite charges? They will attract. And we get a very, very strong electrostatic force, the strongest of the fundamental forces and that will hold these atoms together and they are nearly impossible, if not impossible, to break apart. The sodium becomes positive, the chlorine becomes negative, sodium chloride, you're not breaking that apart very easily. Okay? 
Now again, we get something like magnesium and fluorine. I'll do that very, very quickly here. We get magnesium and fluorine. Okay, magnesium will give away two electrons, but fluorine has seven and can take only one. One, two, three, four, five, six, so I need one there. Well, magnesium can give one here, but there's still an electron left over. So we put another fluorine. Eh, it can get a little tedious, but this is the way to do it. And then that will come on down here. That means for magnesium fluoride, we used one magnesium and two fluorines in order to get the compound magnesium fluoride. Again, we're gonna do a lot of practice problems with this. Ready? Okay, in the ionic bond, maybe you see it a little better in the computerized picture here. Lithium will give away that one valence electron to the fluorine atom. The lithium, one valence electron to give, fluorine will take one valence electron. What happens? One or more electrons transfer to another atom. Here's your definition of ionic bond. Now, before I finish the words, let's see here. If this electron goes away, okay, let's take that off now. What we have here is still three protons, but now, and that would be positive, but now two electrons, that's negative. This has a positive one electric charge. Fluorine has nine protons and has now gained this extra electron right there, giving that a total of 10. Well, what's negative 10 and positive nine? That's negative one. Positive one, negative one, that totals zero. Lithium fluoride is LIF. One of each will do. All right, take that off. The metal loses every time and becomes positively charged and is called the cation. The nonmetal gains every time in an ionic bond and the nonmetal becomes negatively charged. If we get a total of zero, we're probably good. If we don't, then we might have made a mistake. Actually, we did make a mistake. We'll have to fix that. Practice problems are coming. Ready? Now, look at the sodium. Same idea. Sodium gives away the electron. This whole energy level disappears, and you see the 8. And that's why sodium will give away that electron very easily. Sodium then has a positive 1 charge. Chlorine takes that electron to fill up that outer shell and has a negatively charged atom. Positive 1, negative 1 equals 0. The same happens with any alkali and any halogen. We'll take a look here. All alkalis have one valence electron, so we'll become positive one. All halogens have seven valence and need one more, so they will become negative one. So any alkali, such as potassium, let's make that less sloppy, a little neater, and any halogen, such as bromine, are going to do exactly the same things that sodium and chlorine do. Give away one, take one. That's going to be a positive one, negative one. That one is done. Yes, I made that rhyme intentionally. All right, crystal lattice is when molecules build and build. So you get a whole bunch of these sodium chlorine molecules, sodium chloride, I should say. Well, they're not exactly the same size. In fact, chlorine is much larger than sodium. So when you stack enough of these together, millions and millions and millions of sodium chloride molecules, Eventually, you'll be able to see a grain of salt on your fingertip. And a grain of salt looks a little bit more like a regular definite shape, like a cube. We call that a crystal lattice. Okay, we're going to do much more with this throughout the chapter. And of course, there's another set of notes coming in chapter five. Now, quickly, magnesium oxide. I think this is the last page. Just look. You don't really have to write anything down here. Magnesium in this example has already given away its two valence electrons. That would have been out here if we had that third energy level going, but those have been given away. Therefore, that third energy level no longer exists. Those electrons have jumped over to the oxygen atom. Since magnesium gave away two electrons, you see the charge is plus two. Now you can write it either way for our purposes anyway. The oxygen has just gained those two electrons. 
So that charge is negative two. Plus two minus two, there's nothing more to do. That's a total of zero. That means we did this correctly. And I showed you very quickly about something like a magnesium positive two and a fluorine negative one. Just means we're gonna have to use a second fluorine and do the process twice. A lot of practices with those are coming in the assignments. Another fine job. Thank you for your attention.